This market will boom with the Russia-Ukraine war. Now, throughout history, wars come when markets and economies are tanking, and they've done a good job of pulling economies up through massive amounts of government stimulus and manufacturing. The Russia-Ukraine war happening right now is no different. There are catalysts happening right now that will have profound impacts on certain assets. So in this video, I'm going to break down a massive shift that is happening now because of this war. We're gonna look at a bigger trend and how it plays in and of course, look at a few examples of how you can position yourself to profit from this. So let's go. All right, welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss and I make these videos to change the way you think about money because everything that you've learned is wrong. Now today we're gonna to talk about this war that's happening and how it's providing a massive catalyst to an already bigger trend and of course how we can position ourselves for that. I do wanna mention just real quickly, we have opened up tickets for sale for my Market Disruptors live event coming up soon. Um, there's a link down below. It's our second annual event. We're going to have 15 of the best speakers in the world telling you what they think is going to happen over the next couple of years. And of course, most importantly, what you should be doing about it. We're talking about speakers like Danielle DiMartino Booth, Harry Dent, George Gammon, Jeff Booth, Greg Foss, and many, many others. You can find all the details down below, but let's go ahead and just jump right into this video. So of course, the war, I don't have to remind you, I've talked about it a lot and it's all over the news, right? Russia and Ukraine, lots of stuff going on there. I'm not gonna dig deep into that, but basically there's a couple of points that I wanna show you, the catalyst that's gonna push a bigger trend. So uh, the world really depends on Russia right now. Uh, we depend on them for a lot of things, notably, most notably is the, is the energy. So Europe scrambles to reduce its dependency on Russian energy. Of course, um, really nobody wants to go to war. Nobody wants to go to war with Russia. And so what they're using is sanctions, economic sanctions. The problem is they can't sanction Russia too much because we're so dependent on the energy. So that's a problem we can see here. The Ukraine-Russia Ukraine, uh, crisis forces Germany to rethink its coal exit. So Germany's been getting out of coal for energy, shutting down their nuclear plants for energy, and they've been dependent on Russia, but now they're having to rethink this whole thing. And it's not just uh, oil, or I'm sorry, not just Europe and Germany, the Russia is a major supplier of oil even to the United States. And so the world is really dependent on Russia for energy. And then when we want to sanction them, we don't want to buy their energy anymore, but we're dependent. That's a big problem. So like I said, sanctions have become very difficult. Everyone's trying to pivot to remove their dependence. Of course, this takes a really long time. But one of the big areas that's going to happen is going to be in EV. That's electric vehicle. So sanctions on Russia provide support to EV stocks. We can see here, uh, traders bet that harsh sanctions on Russia will push the world towards clean energy, right? So if Russia has coal and natural gas and oil, carbon, uh, then the, it makes sense the world wants to move to electric, electric vehicle, clean energy, and of course, electric vehicle stocks, it says right here. Markets have underestimated, underestimated, we love, we love when markets underestimate, uh, the potential severity of sanctions on Russia, and they may serve as a bullish catalyst for the electric vehicle segment in the long term. So if Russia is a leading supplier of carbon, uh, carbon energy and the world wants to get away from that, obviously because of the green initiative, but on top of that, getting away from Russia as well, there's going to be a mad push into electric vehicles, electric energy, green energy. So that is the catalyst that's already gonna come behind and push a massive trend. Now let's dig into that trend just a little bit. So um, I've talked a lot about technological revolutions. Now, these are things that change the course of humanity. There's been five of them, the Industrial Revolution, steam engines and railways, electricity, steel, and then of course in the early 1900s, it was oil and automobiles. For all of humanity, people walked and rode horses, and now we could drive. It was a pretty big deal. It changed the way the world worked, and we had microprocessors, and right now we're in the middle of this decentralized protocol. But when something like this happens, it's what's called creative destruction. Something new is so much better a thousand times better that it completely kills the old way of doing things. And that's what we're talking about here. We could see um, in just about six or seven years in New York City, you could take a picture of New York City and it would be all horses and buggies. And just a few years later, 
it was all cars. It happens that quickly and we're witnessing another shift like that right now. And part of the reason why is because if we look at electric vehicles versus ICE, this is internal combustion engine vehicles, gas motors uh, versus ICE, EVs are pretty good in a lot of areas. Now, I'm, I've been very critical about EVs, and I still am. I'm going to get to some of the critical things that I have about them. But um, they do seem to handle better for the cars, and they've been more high-end cars that have been made so far. But because they don't have all the weight of the engines and so forth, they have a much lower center of gravity, so they handle pretty good. I've been a car guy. I love cars. I love trucks. Uh, so these are things I pay attention to. They're more economical, of course, not only because you don't have to put gas in them, uh, you do have to put electricity into it, but they're more economical because there's way less moving parts to break down. So besides just the gas savings itself, you have massive savings on all the other additional parts that are inside there that break down. Uh, they're definitely much faster. Like the Tesla car is, I think, like the fastest production vehicle in the world from like zero to 60. And some of the new ones, even from like a quarter mile, are like very, very, very fast. Uh, they're much more quiet. You don't have the engine. Now, as a truck guy, I kind of like hearing my V8 rumble. Um, you don't have that in the electric vehicles. They are much more quiet. And then, like I said, because they don't have all the parts in them, they're also more reliable, uh, more economical uh, because of that. And so if you compare the two, there's a lot to like about this. Now, there's a lot to not like about it as well. I'll talk about some of the criticisms in a second, but um, this is a massive evolution revolution. I put the small r there. So it's a revolution where um, something new is going to replace the old, but it's an evolution where things are improving at a very rapid rate. And ultimately, this is what we call a mega trend. So as investors, you know, you've heard the saying over and over and over with Wayne Gretzky, skate to where the puck is going to be. And so as investors, we use that like, how do I get in front of a trend? Well, this is a mega trend, and this is a trend that we can get into early. We're still at the very, very beginning stages of this, I'll show you. And so we want to ride this trend for a long time. I've been talking about it for a while, but you can see the rise of electric cars, just how fast this is shooting up. And as a matter of fact, every single car company right now is working on electric vehicles. GM and Ford and Chrysler and BMW and Porsche and Mercedes, I mean, Cadillac, you name it, they are all working on electric vehicles. But the average person is still somewhat unaware of this because you don't see them all over the road yet. It's part of the reason why is because all these major manufacturers, it takes them five, six years at least to get that car rolled out. So over the next probably 12 to 24 months, you are going to start seeing them blow up everywhere. Part of the reason why is because they're finally ready. So we're going to start seeing them roll out. Part of it is also because of laws and regulations and mandates. So we can see here at least 10 automak uh, automakers are promising to make um, only electric. So getting rid of their gas and going only electric um, in the coming years, uh, many of them as soon as 2025. That's three years away. Yeah, so it's going to come really, really fast. Uh, there's massive political pressure right, from different states. So, for example, in the great state of California, uh, they set a goal to end gas-powered cars by the end of 2035. In the sale of gas-powered cars by 2035. This is going to happen really fast in Japan. It's also ending gasoline car sales by the mid-2030s, so about you know eight to 10 years. Norway plans to phase out gas car sales even sooner by 2025. So in the next three years, Norway says no more gas cars. This is going to happen very fast. All right, now, supply and demand. Look, I mean, there's all these talking heads talking about finance. You can go get your PhD in economics. I'll make it really simple. It all breaks down to supply and demand. If there is less supply than there is demand, prices go up, right? And so that is a problem. One of the things I've been very critical on EVs for is the lithium problem. And so they need batteries. And to get the batteries, you have to dig up minerals out of the ground. One that's depending on how you look at the climate, that may not be so good to dig up large areas of the ground, but even more so, um, these minerals are scarce. There's not enough supply for the demand. Now, as an investor, that's a good opportunity for us. So we see that th there's about, there's thousands of tons of lithium that's going to be needed just in the next couple of years to keep up with the demand that is going to bring these uh, electric vehicles to market. The problem that we have, the problem that the world has, as an investor, it's good, is that it's about 10 years to get a new mine up and running. So to go find it, break the ground, find it, you know, get all the geological stuff done, and bring it to market, it's about a 10-year time frame. But we don't have 10 years. 
within the next three years, countries are going to start phasing out all gas altogether. We are going to see a massive trajectory, and it takes 10 years to bring new lithium online. So again, supply and demand sounds pretty good. Now, the other problem is that we need it to be about 100 kilowatts per hour for an electric vehicle to be competitive on price with a gas vehicle. The problem is that while lithium has been going down for the last several years, we're down to about 130, 140 um, dollars per kilowatt hour. Now, because we're in short supply, now because of situations like in uh, Russia, Ukraine, supply chains, etc., we're seeing the price of lithium going up and it's pushing that back up. So we need to bring on massive amounts of supply to meet the demand so we can bring that price back down to make them affordable. All right, and like I said, the rising prices are making this very difficult. We can see here in an article from Bloomberg, it says that there's complete over-optimism about the responsiveness of supply in the lithium market. It's not responsive. People just think it should just magically create more. They're overly optimistic is what Bloomberg says. It's very hard to see how it's going to accelerate at the speed that the battery market and electric vehicles are accelerating. So there's way more electric vehicles and batteries coming online then there is lithium for that. And it's not just electric vehicles. All batteries, or most of the new batteries today, use lithium as well. And so we can see that. Now, I talked about this in this video. Uh, I'll get the editor to go ahead and link it up here if you want to go back and watch this. This was from October of 2020. So it was about a year and a half ago. I talked about this very situation. I said, don't buy Tesla now. What I was saying is this is going to be a massive trend. And rather than try to pick individual car companies, like I'll bet on Tesla, I'll bet on Rivian, I'll bet on whatever, um, a lot of these small car companies have gone bust. And so I said, a better way to play it is they all need one thing in common, which is a battery, which has lithium. So why don't we play lithium? And in that video back in October of 2020, I recommended instead of trying to buy car companies and play that, we could just buy lithium. We could buy an ETF that has lithium miners. And as a matter of fact, since that date when I've recommended it, you can see we are up almost 100% almost doubled your money if you would have bought lithium at that point in time. Now, that doesn't mean you've missed out. As a matter of fact, this trend is just getting going. And as much as I like to play a broad trend, uh, or I should say, a, uh, well, it is a broad trend, but this is like a broad basket, um, that's good. If you're just moving into it, it's a good way to have a diversified position. But if you really want to see massive profits, the 10x types of profits in this type of boom, sometimes we want to dig into smaller, more individual companies. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Now, I do want to uh, advise you or warn you at this point right now, this is going to be a promotion that I'm doing for a company. I am not telling you to buy this company. I'm doing a review of it. I think it's a good educational way for you to look at this. Um, as I showed you, there's an ETF if you want broad exposure, but if you want to dig into individual companies, that's where you'll see your 5X, your 10X, your 20X positions. And so I'm going to show you one that I think is good. Uh, again, I'm not telling you to buy it, but it's worth checking out at least for your education. So I'm talking about lithium Chile. Of course, Chile is where most of this lithium comes from. It's known as the lithium triangle. So we can see here on Wikipedia right here, the lithium triangle. Um, this area is thought to hold around 54% of the world's lithium reserves. So over half of all the lithium in the world sits right in this little area right here. It's a pretty good district to get that. Now we can also see here back to this Bloomberg article that the mining industry has a reputation for failing to deliver on targets. Remember, it says I took, I said it took about 10 years to get a project to market, so they typically fall behind. Estimates that more than 80% of projects come in late, right? It takes 10 years to get it to market. We can see here that Serbia, so on top of that, we have environmental hurdles. Serbia has last month put a stop to Rio Tinto's plans for a $2.4 billion mine. So um, some parts of the world, like Serbia, are really cracking down on lithium mining because of the environmental concerns. Now, again, supply and demand, if they continue to su shut down supply, what do you think is going to happen? Well, it's going to push more demand over to the existing ones. And of course, Chile, like I said, is, is one of the better mining districts. Um, and this company, Lithium Chile, that we're talking about, they have a new mine that's basically, they've been working on really fast, 24 trench pits. Uh, all these holes have been drilled. They have the geophysical test work done, geochemical testing done, the environmental studies are done. And all the results that they've been doing have been attracting massive attention from bigger lithium companies. 
and from even companies like the Chinese who are looking for more lithium to add. So it's attracting a lot of attention. There's a lot of momentum going on with this. Um, and what I like about this is it's a perfect acquisition target. So the way this works is that these smaller companies, they're risky, they're volatile. You can make massive gains on them. Uh, use a stop loss if you're buying them because they could also go down. Um, but what happens is the bigger companies need to bring on supply fast. They don't have 10 years to go start a new mine. And so they'll look for little mines that already have going and they'll acquire them, they'll buy them. It's much easier to expand a mine than it is to start from scratch. And so these big ones, they need that fast supply. I need it right now. I can expand it. I don't have 10 years to wait. Um, and they want to do that in the cheapest producing regions, which of course, as I said, is in Chile. That's the cheapest place to do it. And what's good about this company too is that there's insider ownership, which I really like because that means everybody has skin in the game. All right, now I just want to run you through a little bit of math real quick. And so I can show you how I do it. And so you can learn from this, um, but I like to, believe that success leaves clues. We do the same thing that other successful people or projects have done, and hopefully we have about the same results. And so if we talk about this acquisition, which I think these are perfect acquisition targets, uh, we want to have a calculation. And we can do that by looking at what the competition has done and how they've fared. Um, and so we can see here um, the competition that's around them. These are the neighbor mines. So they have the Era mine. It's to the west and the north. We have Hanari, north and west. We have Lytica here to the south. Uh, Tibet Summit, um, and there's some other smaller projects. So it's surrounded, of course, because Chile is the main area to get this uh, lithium. Like I said, over half of the lithium in the world comes from Chile. And if we look at that, we can break down some of these numbers. And so we can see here um, lithium, uh, yeah, lithium brine right here. They have a uh, $400 per share price. Ne uh, Neo Lithium has a $2 share price. Myth, uh, Millennial Lithium has a, about a $2 share price, and Alpha Lithium has a $2 share price. So that's where they sit at about $2, but that doesn't tell you the whole picture because you have to see what assets do they have, and then how are those values, how are those assets valued. So this doesn't really tell you the whole picture, I mean, unless you dug into that. Uh, but here's some simple uh, calculations. So we have uh, nearby BYD and Minerist del Norte. They paid for the right to sell lithium in this area, all right? Um, there is they, they got the right to sell 80,000 metric tons in uh, a year in Chile. But the thing is, is, there's no lithium. There's no guarantee of finding any lithium. They were only paying for the right to do that, just for the right to produce it and export it if they find it. Um, so they paid 61 million for BYD. They paid 60 million for Minas de Norte. And so if we break that down, remember how much assets, how much lithium do they have versus how much they paid, it works out to be about $750 per ton of lithium. All right, that's the number. So now let's go look and see what we have here at $750 per ton. So if we look at the acquisition calculation now on the asset, we can see that lithium Chile's just their one resource project they have right here, they have almost 1.5 met million metric tons, 1.420. If we take the 750 times the 1.420 million metric tons, times 60%, times a $1.27, and then we divide it by how many shares are for sale, then we come up with about a $4 USD per share based off of other projects that have sold nearby. Now, uh, it's nowhere near that price today, and I'm not saying or predicting or promising it will get to that point, but judging other products that have sold recently, that's what it breaks down to. There's a pretty good upside for this. So anyway, there's a catalyst. The war in Ukraine is going to drive the world even faster out of carbon fuel and move them into electric clean energy um, that's pushing an already massive trend to EV vehicles. One of the best ways to play it, as I told you a year and a half ago, is through lithium because they all need it. Um, I gave you an example of a broad way to play lithium. Here's a specific way to play a very specific lithium play. But what do you think about electric vehicles? I said that in a lot of ways they're superior to ICE vehicles. Do you agree? Leave me a comment and say yes, they're superior or no, they are not. I'd love to hear what you think about this. Um, of course, as always, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. If you don't like the video, that's okay. Give me a thumbs down either way, but at least leave me a comment. And don't forget marketdisruptorslive.com. The live event is coming up in just a couple months. There's a link down below to get more info. That's what I got for you today. All right, to your success. I'm out.